Luke 12 and verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they began trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will be disclosed, that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. It often appears in the scriptures as we read them, especially with the sermons of the Lord Jesus, that he just sort of gives an aggregate of statements with no overall structure, and that the statements, they're not really in any way connected to each other. We have something about hypocrisy, and then about the hairs of our heads being numbered, and then about what we say when we're before the authorities and how we're not to take thought as to what we will say. And so it appears as though it's a bit of a preacher's nightmare because there's no really overall structure that you can draw out of a text like that. But actually, that's not true here. That's not actually what we have. But if we are to have a key to unlock what's going on, we must first look at Luke 11. Aaron referenced this block of text earlier in the children's talk. And so if you would look earlier at Luke 11, at verses 52 through to 54... We actually have the context for what Jesus is saying here. In 52, he speaks to the lawyers. He says, Woe unto you, lawyers, you have taken away the key of knowledge and not entered in yourselves. And those who were entering in, you have hindered. And then he goes, and then after he says that, after he rebukes them, their response is they begin to urge him and to provoke him to speak of many things, lying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. There are two things which define this interaction between Christ and the Pharisees. And this then goes on to frame the sermon which Christ gives in these 12 verses which I have just read. We see from verse 52 that they were hypocrites, those who were entrusted to help people enter into a relationship with God, not only hadn't entered in themselves, but were hindering other people from going in. They were a stumbling block. They who professed godliness, who were supposed to be the priests, the religious leaders, were actually hindering the people. And of course, themselves, like a cup, were dark and filthy on the inside. They were hypocrites. And that's the first element which frames what we've got this morning. And so, in verses 53 and 54, after Jesus says that, we have their reaction. And what is their reaction when they're rebuked? As we all know, the Pharisees are famous for being penitent. They fall at their feet. They say, you're right, Jesus, we're so sorry. We will follow you now. No, no, actually, that's not what happens. They didn't fall at his feet. They didn't forsake their lofty titles and they didn't follow him. No, rather... They conspired to kill him, 
lying in wait, seeking how they might catch him out. And that's the second thing which we have, which will frame what Jesus is saying here. It is persecution. So this discourse is framed in terms of hypocrisy and persecution. And now in verse 1 of chapter 12, he addresses it to his disciples. And my message to you this morning, like Jesus is to his disciples, will cover the threat of hypocrisy from within each of us and the threat of persecution from without, from the world. And it's just as relevant because we are Christ's disciples as they were. And it's relevant for Christ's disciples in all ages, for us today. For us as evangelicals in this age, it is particularly easy to be a Pharisee. It is easy to, oh, theology is so much better, so much, so much more well articulated than, than the liberals or than this denomination or that denomination. It is easy to say, oh Lord, I thank you that I am not as other men, as the Pharisees did. When we look at a culture as degenerate as ours, it's easy to say, I told you so, as you watch this country circle the drain. And it's also needful to consider persecution and to count the cost of following Christ as the exclusion of Christians from respectable society begins to gather steam here in Britain. So just before we properly jump in, there are just one or two other things as well that I would like us to bear in mind. Just one or two other things. Firstly, this is not uh, Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is not connected to the other instances in the Gospels, in Mark 3 and Matthew 21, which mention the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because Christ makes many of the same points... In those instances, it doesn't mean that these accounts are necessarily parallel. Many so-called Bible contradictions, which have come forth from the imaginations of scholars in the last 150 years or so, pick out different occasions where Jesus says many of the same things, and then tries to claim that they're all referring to the same event. And then they go, well, oh, look, and see all these different accounts. They're all different times and places, and it's all garbled, and they contradict each other. And the Gospels really are contradictory and not that reliable, and it's not the Word of God. But all good preachers have their hobby horses, and they make points, the same points, on more than one occasion and in different places. So this does appear to stand on its own. So... Let us dive in, and we're going to go through the text twice. I'm sorry, it's, it's a buy one, get one free. It's two sermons in one. And we're first going to consider Jesus' warnings against hypocrisy. That's how he starts, his warnings against hypocrisy. And following on from what he says with the Pharisees in chapter 11, he says, it says in the, the old King James that I've got in front of me, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees. Yeast is a eukaryotic single-celled fungus, as I'm sure you all know very, very well. I'm sure you've all got your uh, taxonomy charts in your kitchens, etc. So what has it got to do with hypocrisy? The yeast of the Pharisees. And they were known for many things, the Pharisees. Baking, perhaps not. Well, a little yeast in a lump of dough makes the whole bread rise. The yeast multiplies within the dough and it works slowly and silently, not noticing from one second to the next the impact the yeast is having on the dough. And likewise, hypocrisy, it works slowly, silently beneath the surface, covering its tracks. And it spreads throughout your whole person until your character has been hollowed out. And you end up nothing more than a Pharisee. The Pharisees themselves may be dead, but their leaven lives on. And having made the cutting comparison, the Lord Jesus then lays hypocrisy bare. He exposes it utterly. 
Often when I'm reading what Jesus is saying, I think this guy would have been the best debater ever. He's so skilled in what he says. What does he say? There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. What you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed from the roofs. Judgment Day has actually made hypocrisy completely pointless. Hypocrisy is actually futile. There's no point in acting like a good Christian. There's no point in slapping that veneer over our lives like a cheap paint. You know, my generation are the worst for this. It's social media. We all know people and we know what they're really like and the struggles that they go through. But then they would post a picture on Facebook with a cup of coffee and an open Bible with their best Instagram filter over the top. Hashtag blessed, hashtag humbled. That's not actually relevant, but uh, why is it pointless? Why is hypocrisy pointless? Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. We will all see what's really going on on Judgment Day. Secrecy is a myth. It doesn't exist. Not for us, not even for the non-Christian. We will all stand before God. It shall all be revealed. It's quite frightening, really. But then, rest assured, we needn't become angry about the hypocrisy of others. We needn't take up our, uh, our rage and our pitchforks at, at these other people, or these social media Christians that I have just decried. Or else, ironically, we would become hypocrites too. As this same judgment day where all shall be revealed is the same judgment day where justice will be meted out. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It is not for us to get on our high horses about, quite the contrary. So moving on to verses 4 and 5. He says unto his disciples, do not be afraid of those that can kill the body and after that they can do nothing more. I will tell you whom you should fear. Fear him, which after he has killed the body, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. We will consider this text in the next half of, of, uh, of our message this morning in terms of persecution. That's obviously you know, something to which it is referring. But there is an element of hypocrisy in here as well. These verses tell us not to fear man those who can kill the body and do no more, but rather to fear God. It is God that has the power to cast into hell. This is not referring to the devil here. Jesus would never tell us to fear the devil. We're told to fear God. So where's the hypocrisy? What am I talking about? You know when preachers go, uh, they, they over-egg their, their points and they take it too far? I'm not quite at that point yet. To claim to be a Christian, to be one who fears God, is to be set apart from the world. We are dead to the world. The world is dead to us. The world has no claim on us. We shouldn't fear, therefore, what our friends, our colleagues, or even what the state can do to us. We're dead to the world. If God is for us, who can stand against? So to be a Christian... And therefore to claim that you fear God, but to actually fear man, is to practice one thing and to preach another. It is in itself a form of hypocrisy. And as I've said, there are no hypocrites with God. There is no such thing as a double life before him. He sees everything. To fear God is to reject hypocrisy. To be a Pharisee is to fear man. The Pharisees, of course, defined themselves on what others saw of them, neglecting what's on the inside. We're going to skip to verses 8 and 9. We're not going to omit 6 and 7. We'll come back to them later. But verses 8 and 9, I say unto you, whoever confesses me before men... Him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God, but he that denies me shall be denied before the angels of God. This is an example of what we have been considering. This is an example of 
What happens when you do not fear God, but fear man instead? Why? Because what is wrong with denying the Lord that bought us? What would be wrong with doing that? Why not save our own skin? Are we not more valuable than sparrows? Certainly in other religions, in Islam for example, an allowance is made for when you're persecuted to deny that you are a Muslim. You're allowed to say at gunpoint, oh no, no, Muhammad never heard of him. And then you're allowed to save your own skin and practice in secret. No such allowances here are made by Jesus. Why? Because again, to deny the Son of Man is to preach one thing for the Christian and to practice another. It is another form of hypocrisy. And we will consider this in the light of persecution as well later, because they do touch upon each other. They do relate to each other. In his message to his disciples after having spoken to the Pharisees, he's saying, look, do not be like these guys. When you come to practice your form of godliness in the new covenant, do not be like these guys. Do not deny me before men. Do not fear man. And so now moving on into verse 10. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, he shall not be forgiven. This is a, a famous, difficult saying of Jesus. What on earth is going on here? As we've seen, you can deny Christ before men and it means that he will deny you. But we know from later on in the Gospels that Peter denied Christ, didn't he? Surely the great apostle Peter, who authored two of the letters in our New Testament, will he, will he be denied before the angels of God? No, of course not. He was restored. He was forgiven. He uh, at Pentecost, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He's a great man of God. And that's what it says here. You can be forgiven for speaking against the Lord Jesus. You can deny him, but you can be forgiven for it. But then we see that there is such a thing as an unpardonable sin. What is it? And how does that fit in with our view of redemption. Surely as, as evangelicals with our theology in its right place we believe that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin surely. How on earth can we have unpardonable sins? Is the gospel about to come crashing down around our, our ears? No, no, I'm being melodramatic of course. This unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, on the surface it appears as though it's saying anything bad about the Holy Spirit, but it's not. That's not what it is. A group of atheists made a video a number of years ago, and it was like a montage of all these people in front of a camera going, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And then they would gloat about how now we can never, that's the correct expression to pull, they gloat about how now we can never ever be forgiven. Aha, you Christians, you can't get us now. But they were reading the scripture, of course, with dim, unregenerate eyes, missing the point completely. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is rejecting God's truth with the heart, whilst it is clearly known with the head. It mixes the light of understanding with the stubbornness of the will. It is rejecting God's truth with the heart, whilst it is clearly known with the head. What does that have to do with the Holy Spirit though, really? Because it is the Spirit who applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ. It is the Spirit who renews our wills and thereby persuades and enables us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the Gospel. To blaspheme the Spirit, therefore, is to reject the renewal of the will in the light of Christ. And the Pharisees did this by attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. They, having seen Jesus cast out a demon, they said, well, he does this by the power of Satan. And Jesus points out they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, having clearly seen who Jesus is and what he can do. 
having known the truth with their heads, they reject it with their hearts. It is by the power of Satan that you do these things. And they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So in what sense then is this unforgivable? Well, the one who commits this sin, the one who hardens his heart, is the one who never seeks forgiveness. That's the truth. That is the person who blasphemes the Holy Spirit, the one who never seeks forgiveness, despite knowing who Jesus really is. And in the hardness of their hearts, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And there are people like this, not just the Pharisees, but in churches. People who hear the gospel week after week, year after year, but just let it wash over them, never owning it for themselves, never coming before the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, hardening their hearts to its impact time after time. And if there's anyone here this morning, for instance, who has not come to Christ for forgiveness, do not end up blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Come to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins if you haven't already done so. That's, of course, my appeal to everyone here. Now, this seems like a bit of a rabbit hole, but this does actually fit into the structure that we've been considering of hypocrisy and persecution, because this is talking, of course, of the Pharisees. The conclusion of hypocrisy is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, confessing it with your mind, but not with your heart on the inside. It is, the, it is hypocrisy at its logical conclusion. It is hypocrisy once it has ossified and hardened into an unforgivable sin. It is these same Pharisees with whom Jesus is talking and warning against, who then go on to see the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, and they resolved not to repent and join the church, but rather to persecute it. And that now brings us on nicely to my next point this morning. We've considered the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and that spirit inside of us. But now let's consider the persecution of the Pharisees from without. And so now we're going to rewind and go back through our text, back to verses 4 and five, do not be afraid of them that can kill the body, and after that they can do no more. But I'll tell you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed the body, has power to cast into hell. I say unto you, fear him. Jesus tells us that we don't have to fear man, because all they can do, the only thing they can do, is kill us. And to live is Christ, and to die is gain, right? Well, it's it's easier said than done, isn't it? But there are some encouragements here from church history. It's just, some, just one or two quotes that I would like to consider of people who, suffering the persecution of hypocrites and Pharisees in their day, were not afraid of man, who did not fear man, and who, fearing God, loved not their lives unto death. And the first one I'd like to consider is Bishop Hooper. Has anyone heard of Bishop Hooper? Hooper. He's, there's, an, there's a record of him in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And what he said as he was led to being burnt at the stake for being a Protestant and for not being a Catholic. And he sums up perfectly what Jesus says in these two verses about not fearing man but fearing God because man can only kill you but God can cast into hell. Hooper said, life is sweet and death is bitter. But eternal life is more sweet and eternal death is more bitter. And that perfectly sums up not fearing man but fearing God. That accurately reflects the stakes of how we should live. And speaking of martyrdom, Martin Luther had this belter of a quote. Martin Luther said, world, death, devil, hell, away and leave me in peace. You have no hold on me. If you will not let me live, then I will die. But you won't succeed in that. Chop off my head and it won't harm me. I have one who will give me a new one. 
How good is that? Although it is worth mentioning that for all his grandiose words, Martin Luther made friends in high places and was protected by Frederick the Elector of Saxony until the day that he died. So uh, way to go, Martin Luther. And then verses 6 through 7, which we omitted last time. There's further encouragement to the persecuted believer. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies or two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, because you are of much more value than many sparrows. Not a single cheap sparrow is forgotten before God. How much more, therefore, will God remember us? Us who are made in his image, whom he has brought back with the life and the blood of his own son, and who has more adopted us into his family, such that we have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Friends, you are never forgotten before God. You are never forgotten before God. And clearly, this God whom we worship and to whom we belong is supremely powerful, powerful beyond measure. Why? He has numbered all the hairs on our head. He's not counted them, he's numbered them. They have numbers. He didn't have to count them. He knows them innately. In fact, not to get too abstract, but his knowledge of the hairs on our heads precedes the existence of the hairs themselves. That's how sovereign and powerful God is. But what does this mean? As Aaron was saying earlier in the time of prayer about things that happen in this world, it means that not a single hair can fall from your head, let alone anything else that would happen to you in life, let alone being martyred. Not a single hair can fall from your head without the express permission of of God. And this means no matter what trials and tribulations we have and that we face in life, God is in control. He is working them both for his glory but also for your good, even if like Bishop Hooper you are to be martyred. Many people don't actually like the idea that God is in control of our suffering. I can understand why. But the alternative is so much worse. Would you rather that God was not in control of your suffering and of your pain? Would you rather that your suffering did not work together for the glory of God and for your own good? No, I thank God that he is in control. This then frees us up to confess Christ confidently. And at all times, in all circumstances, and to all people. Psalm 118.6 The Lord is on my side, I will not fear, for what can man do to me? And we saw earlier that hypocrisy was pointless. Well, even in the light of persecution, denying Christ is pointless too. What can man do to me? Do not deny him. And of course, if anyone here has ever denied Christ in their lives, I know that I have, in fact, before my friends when I was a teenager, out outright said, no, I'm not a Christian. There is forgiveness in Christ. And finally, let's consider the last two verses that we have here. And when they bring you into the synagogues and take you to the authorities, do not take any thought for how you will answer or how you will defend yourselves, or what you shall say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. In contradistinction to those who blaspheme the Spirit in their hypocrisy, the Holy Spirit helps those genuine believers in persecution, at the hands of those Pharisees. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the deposit that Christ has sent to live in us to guarantee that we will join him in the next life and that we will be reunited with him at death. Therefore, he is interested in helping us. The Spirit is interested in helping us. And in persecution, this manifests itself. He tells us what to say. Take no thought as to what you shall say. Has anyone ever experienced this, I wonder? 
perhaps if in evangelism, in conversation with an unbeliever, you've said something where looking back you think, I never would have thought to say that. That has come from the Spirit. I've had a couple of times like that whose promises are true. And probably the best example this morning I have is that I've put no thought into this sermon this morning and it's going okay so far. But there is a more general principle to be extracted here. A more general principle. The Holy Spirit gives us what we need in each and every season of life. I spoke of martyrdom earlier. How is it that a person reaches a point where they can boldly die for the Lord Jesus? You know, church history is almost, it's almost sensational. Bishop Hooper, as he's being led out to be burnt at the stake. Eternal life is more sweet and eternal death is more bitter. How do they reach this point? Are they just really magnificent? Are they, are they a cast above us like the Pharisees of old? No, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit in them. He prepares his people for such trials. And if you're a Christian here this morning... And if someone were to hold a gun to your head and ask you to deny Christ, although you don't believe it, you would, by the grace of God, take the bullet because of the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's not just true of an example as extreme as martyrdom. In every season of life, this is true. He gives you what you need. My grace is sufficient for you, says Paul. Or says the Lord Jesus to Paul, rather. So, just to conclude and to bring this all together, I hope, hopefully it's not seemed as though it's been a bit erratic, a bit all over the place. But just to, uh, just to, just to finally get that structure hammered out, this sermon is primarily one of warning. It's one of warning. Not to be like the Pharisees, who were hypocrites, who would deny Christ and who would end up blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but also to expect that there will be people like the Pharisees who will persecute you and even kill you for righteousness' sake, lest the light of Christ in us expose the darkness that is in them. But not to leave everything in doom and gloom, Jesus has made promises to us Here in this sermon he has promised the presence of a God who loves us and has numbered the hairs on our heads. And he has promised the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And finally, and a bit more acquiredly, he there is he leads the promise of judgment day, where the Pharisees among us will be exposed and they shall have justice meted out to them. And where the righteousness of Christ on his disciples and over our lives will be vindicated. That has been what Jesus is saying here this morning.